Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to episode three of the English edition of the Bait Podcast, brought to you by Rivalry.com, one of the great sponsors at Bait. Uh, I think you can head over to Rivalry.com, register an account, get a little bonus if you want to start betting a little bit. That would be great for us if you could support the sponsors. Thank you so much. Dendi, welcome back to another episode. How you doing, bud? Hello, I'm doing great. Nice to hear you. You as well. It's always a pleasure to get to sit down and chat with you every other week. Uh, I think today we're going to talk about some news. There are some things that uh, came out today, and we'll maybe talk about the meta a little bit. Uh, but you've finally gotten a little bit of time off, huh? Uh, finally, the grind of, of nonstop Dota matches has slowed down for you. Yep, yep. Finally, we had some time, a little bit, very small time to rest, to be honest, because uh, currently we're having team rebuilding and yeah i mean we're like i'm in in a mode of testing a lot of different players for different roles so it's not a simple thing i guess yeah can can you share anything about that process with us like is it interview style where you're scouting players and then it's like phone calls to talk about interest or like how do you approach that process of finding like team rebuilding as you put it mm -hmm. i'm using some stats using some information using some feedback from different players and then this way i'm talking to other like to the players uh, i'm thinking of like uh, it's not also so many options uh, uh, for me because a lot of players are in teams and they're like locked there uh, so yeah so i'm getting to those players talking to them and if they are interested we are going to play some test games i'm trying to make like line up a look uh like i don't know i don't know some players well i know some players better i know like some mm -hmm. of them are like more greedy or less greedy and stuff like this like <laughs> trying to mix it up from uh let's say my some of my own vision or my mind but obviously like, before coming to conclusion you need to see and stuff like this so it takes time and usually uh yeah you need actually a lot of time to see how uh, this or that player works how can you match them together and stuff like this so it's not as simple yeah stuff it seems like the entire cis region is fluxing a little bit right now in terms of rosters like i know navi has had some roster issues uh even spirit when they started dota pit they had immersion and afterlife and now they've got mm -hmm. Yamich and Malik, I think, playing as stand-ins. And I'm not sure if they're stand-ins or if they're actually going to be joining Spirit. But I, I guess uh, we're not alone uh, in terms of roster shuffling a little bit for CIS. Yeah, it's kind of roster shuffle under underground uh, going right now. So we'll see how it turns out. I hope everything works well for us. You'll see. Yeah, me, me too. Uh, always always stressful times. Uh, a lot of things unknown, but also exciting, right? New beginnings. Um, I want to ask you about a drama that came out, uh, I think it was like May 7th or something when the article dropped. So it was uh, it's an old drama now, but the stuff surrounding Windstrike. Did you uh, happen to catch any of that news? Yeah, I saw something but, uh, about uh, Windstrike uh, having some something not paid to different teams for different reasons yeah but uh, to be honest that's uh, weird to me i don't know like i didn't follow how drama ended because <laughs> uh, so something uh, came out right like there was some also podcasts the video where like uh, we were explaining things and stuff yeah, well, so it was a peculiar drama because usually these are like, hey, we hired this team and then the org didn't pay them anything or they won money and then somehow the money didn't get up to the players. These were all strange, like, well, we paid the contract, but it was on a different timeline that was in the contract or we didn't pay like the penalty for our payments being late. It was just sort of odd like they paid most of the money but there were certain scenarios where where they didn't um it was just peculiar and it kind of led me to a broader conversation that i wanted to pick your brain about with contracts and esports and this issue of e contracts are really important but i think a, a lot of people approach them sort of like uh, what are you going to do if i break this are you actually going to sue me and how you know that that's difficult for teams if people don't actually honor the contracts that they sign yeah well uh, we know esports is still very young, right? So all those things were pretty rough. Like uh, to get 
into like to follow the contract things and you know to sue someone is it's uh, sometimes is uh, very hard it's very not simple sometimes it might not even work depends on the country and how strict are the rules for esports mm-hmm. and stuff like uh, on the um, uh, country level like right. in, in, on poli- political level or whatever yeah so yeah like i think we still growing we still young we still fresh on those uh, topics like, yeah. And some of it is the finances. Like it's expensive to try to sue people and like take them to court. Yeah, yeah. And especially when it's international, you have to hire like a specialist lawyer that knows the country that you have to sue in or whatever it is. When we had that issue with the event we did in Canada like five years ago, they didn't pay the talent fees. And the only way we were able to get paid was to go public. Kind of exactly like this article. You, you can't justify suing when strikes. So you do the next best thing. You make it public and then at least, uh, I guess, other people are aware when they do business with them moving forward. Do, do you think this will hurt Winstrike? Like, from a player perspective, would, do you think this will um, kind of deter players from wanting to play under that brand? Um, from a player perspective, probably not. I'm not sure. Like, well, it's definitely you think about it, but uh, I don't think it's a big deal from player perspective. From a uh, or perspective, I actually don't know. I don't even. I still don't know who is right or who is wrong, like and stuff like this. So, yeah. Okay. I guess we'll see. It said in the initial article, at least, that some of the orgs were planning on pursuing legal action. So, we uh, we might get a conclusion at some point in the future, whenever the courts catch up. I mean, that that reminds me of the those GESC tournaments. Did you play in any of those? Yeah, those yeah, we did. I think we got uh, top three on uh, the GSC minor, if I'm not mistaken, in Jakarta. Top three or top four? Yeah, I, and yeah. I said, did you guys ever get paid for that? I don't think so. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I don't think so. Probably not. Yeah. I don't think most people did because I know from the talent side they weren't paid for the first event because there were originally going to be four GESCs and then they reduced it to two. And the mm-hmm. first one happened, and the talent had a lot of complaints, and they didn't get paid. And then they got invited to the second event, and they all agreed to go and sort of like, all right, we might not get paid for this. And then they didn't. So I think it was a double loss for mo- pretty much everybody that participated in that shit. Players, yeah, it feels, talent. It feels very sad. Yeah. But Valve did actually sue them. I, I think six months ago or something like that, uh, I saw an article come out that uh, the Valve legal team is filing official proceedings to try to I, I mean i don't know even know if they can get the money back if gesc even has the money but to at least uh make a public spectacle out of it so it doesn't happen again yeah i mean uh, someone like valve probably can afford suing anybody right in uh, if something goes wrong and i think it's it's good that they're doing it because uh they kind of trying to defend everyone in in this direction yeah absolutely you de- and you want to send a signal that it matters. You know that the contracts matter. When when Moonduck did a minor, we had to sign the long contract of, with all the timelines of all the stuff, all the parameters, and it was a little intimidating. You know, there was a lot of pressure of okay, let's not mess this up. These are the timelines. Let's make sure we do everything right so that we don't violate this Valve contract. And I I was glad to see that they take it seriously and will pursue someone that that doesn't because it's it's bad for all of us. You know, that's just bad for Dota and really unfortunate for players that need that money it's it's hard to be a player dude it's so competitive yeah, i feel it's also set for talents uh, in, in the same way i believe so yeah. it's fair for everyone players like as a player i at least played some games you know like <laughs> uh, it's also a pleasure to me to play in tournament i remember we had some amazing comeback at that uh, in jakarta i i believe like uh, against fnatic i think we played the third game and we were like uh win or lose right we, we we won with mega creeps i think we actually did like 30k comeback and it was like the biggest comeback at the time now we were we were bigger i gotta check this out okay so yeah um you guys tied third and fourth with infamous yeah uh, so at this event it was eg that took first vichy j thunder took second and then it was navi and infamous third fourth so mm-hmm. yeah this was the event yeah I've always wanted to see Jakarta. I've heard it's beautiful. I didn't so much. It was very hot. (laughs) Uh, We had a lot of uh, 
bodyguards when we were going to tournaments like the, it was very big traffic where and we had always like police going with us mm. breaking the way for us you know like wee -oo, wee -oo, <laughs> and we're like yeah hey, let's go <laughs> it was still a lot of fun a lot of fun yeah, yeah. amazing crowd i would say very cool people outside like i, I would yeah. i would like to go again yeah, indonesia is cool I have a lot of good memories in Southeast Asia uh, in terms of esports and Dota. I, I remember one of the first events that you and I ever met was the uh, major uh, Dota Two Major All Stars, the one in Malaysia. the uh, The event wasn't great. That was the one where I think wasn't there a fire in your booth during one of the matches? I think one of the power strips started smoking. Oh, that was so long time ago. It huh? was. I was. I was at BTS then. I think it was two thousand fourteen. Yeah, it was 14 or 15. 14, 14, 14, yes. Yeah. It was 14, end was of a year or something. Really long time yeah. ago. But uh, the one thing I remember from that event, even though that the event itself didn't go that well, the fans were incredible. They were just so passionate, so excited that we were all there, so excited to meet us. It was, uh, that, was that was my first trip to Southeast Asia for a Dota tournament, and it really changed my perspective on how big Dota is globally. Yeah, Dota in Southeast Asia is just crazy, that's for sure. I'm still, like, one thing I miss is, like, going to also South America. I think Dota is also huge where, like, you know, we often have, like, uh, some tournaments in the U.S., right? We had a lot of TIs mm -hmm. and stuff. We had a lot of tournaments here in Europe and CIS. Like we ha we had some in South East Asia, but in South uh, America, I don't think we had uh, many tournaments. No, like, there's there... something that I want also to <laughs> uh, wants uh, organizers to think about it. Yeah. Maybe also Australia or something. I th I think there is also the community where, if I'm not wrong, it's tough. Yeah, what the excuse? Yeah, it, it's tough, man. I would love to go to South. I've never been to South America. I've always wanted to go. I, I know they did one tournament in Peru. I remember talking to Fogged about it, but it's hard. It's such a culture barrier. As, as like an American company, thinking about trying to run an event in Peru is just, it's so difficult. The language is so different. You have to know all these people that can help you locally, and it's, it's a big undertaking. So it's uh, no easy challenge. But I also wanted to ask you about uh, some of this broadcast right stuff. I, I'm sure you followed uh, some of the most recent updates that have come about with uh, the DMCA on one of the South American YouTubers from WePlay. They ended up retracting that DMCA after, uh, I, I guess, reevaluating the broadcast rules that Valve has, has put out that basically as long as you're doing your own camera work, you're not using sponsor ads of your own. If you're mm -hmm. a streamer, you're allowed to watch Dota TV, any tournament, and you can make content around it. Um, and it kind of blew up again. I, I'm curious if you have any thoughts uh, about this topic. Oh, I don't understand. Uh, uh, probably Valve have some reasons behind it why we still allowing to do so. Because to me, it feels um, a little bit sad for tournament organizers also. Because we... Um, I feel like sooner or later we will have less tournaments because of that, maybe. Whereas that can be a reason. And um, same time, I feel like maybe there is other solutions, like someone said, putting delay in uh, uh, for like uh, putting delays, uh, different delay for Dota TV. But there is already, right? I think there is already. So I. Yeah. I think you can around. choose to do it. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. It is possible. You can have like half half an hour DUA instead <laughs> of like four minutes or something. Yeah. Right? That could be an option. And I've, I've heard people mention like putting the sponsor ads in Dota TV so that if, you know, Bulldog's watching Dota or Do through Dota TV, at least your sponsor logos are in there. So it gets some of that reach. That's a potential solution, maybe. Because sooner or later, maybe um, people will stop using Dota TV at all. Like, I mean, tournament organizers. Right. They will come down to that. And it's not good for community, I feel like. Because you want to watch with player perspective and listen to your like, favorite caster. And, you know, maybe you want to sit back and just someone move a camera for you. Yeah. Like all this stuff. So, I don't know. You'll yeah. see how it goes. For me, it's a very weird uh, question. And, like, from my point of view, um, I was always trying to uh, not... Uh, not do it because I respect the amount of work uh, tournament organizers and everyone who is involved doing it, you know, like all the talents, all the casters, everyone, because 
they spend a lot of time, they put in a lot of work into making us happy. And when someone, someone like I, I could comment or whatever, you know, like I will do it. I will stream in a lot of TV and stuff. And maybe a lot of people would come watch me because I will talk some insights and, you know, mm-hmm. some more casual style, something, something. And so suddenly a lot of people already like listening, but this way is like, uh, I understand that I'm damaging uh, everyone who is putting so much work and I, I have huge respect to everyone who is doing who is doing this, right? So I don't want to do it. And I had a lot of opportunities to do it actually myself, but I never do it because I think it's just wrong. But so, someone is doing it, that's fine. Like It's uh, everyone else's decision. But it, I guess it's still up to Valve to decide uh, yeah. if we want to allow this to happen or not. If we do allow this, then probably there are some reasons behind it, but I don't know the reasons, so it's hard for me to judge. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's some value in it. Like, overall, I'm glad that we have Dota TV, and I'm glad that Dota is pretty open and accessible. I would rather it be more accessible than less accessible. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I started casting Dota over other esports. I had an interest in League of Legends at the time, but Dota had Dota TV so that I could practice casting and make content and do Dota radio. League of Legends didn't even have replays, <laughs> let alone yeah. the ability to watch in the client. So that was, I, I mean, I like Dota a lot more. I'm glad that that gave me a natural reason to do stuff in Dota, but that was like the opportunity that let me start my career making Dota content. So I don't want to see that access go away. Uh, it's just trying to balance how that works with really, really big streamers. You know, as someone like Bulldog, who could have 20,000 concurrent viewers, like some of our Midas Mode 2 matches only had 10,000 concurrent viewers. That is not a good look for our sponsors. They're like, why does this guy have twice as many viewers as you do? Can't you tell him to stop? And not really being able to say anything back to the sponsor other than, actually, no, in Dota, he's playing by the rules. That's when it gets scary because I get afraid those sponsors might just spend their money sponsoring other esports where that isn't really a factor. So it's it's tough. Um, I don't know exactly where where the balance is. Yeah, I wanted to find the right decision, right? Yeah, and I wanted to be there for smaller folks to have that opportunity. For smaller streamers, I really don't think it's a problem, and it it feels unfair to punish popular streamers just because they're popular, <laughs> right? So it's that's also true. That's also true. Like, you know, like what? I, what I, is Bulldog a bad guy because he has a lot of fans? No, absolutely not. And yeah, but, people like him. People like watching how he cast, how he talk. People want to right. listen to him. So. There is nothing bad in this too. It's yeah. Just, uh, yeah. It's it, it really is a tough one. I I don't envy Valve in in the fact that they have to draw the line somewhere and decide what's fair and what's not. But uh, one thing I know is that the argument I've seen a lot is like, well, tournaments should just hire the popular streamers, and I think that's a little scary because I think people might not understand how much money a single streamer makes with 15 or 20,000 concurrents on their stream. You know, it's that's that's a big opportunity cost for tournament organizers to have to cover. And I don't even know if tournament organizers could afford it. You know, could you afford to hire Bulldog and Gork and every other streamer that wants to cover your event? Maybe. Uh, maybe not, though. I, I don't know if it's just as easy as open up the wallet and hire everyone. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. And it's... I guess it's different, but OG posted something about having issues with copyright with all these like pop-up streams on Twitch. I don't know if you've seen these, but it's the like sort of scam Arcana entries. Oh yeah, those those SS did on me too. Like, really? Maybe I don't know, ten times, and we like I was even writing people on Twitch and stuff like hey, we need to bring it down. We need to bring it down. Yeah, it happened. And they, they got bring, brought down, but then they make another one and another one and another one. And a lot of, even some people PM me on Twitter, like, oh, we're getting scammed. Like, oh my God, oh my God, help. But uh, not much you can do about this, like, I feel like, because it's hard to react too fast on uh, on those, you know? We put up some numbers, uh, a lot of people come, I can get uh, tricked, someone yeah. sleeping. Some someone uh, just woke up or whatever, like for whatever reasons, people uh, going and see some fake, and we still try it. Yeah. Oh, it's really awful, and it, yeah, it, it's that we get tricked. Yeah, and I think you're right that it's hard from like your perspective. It's hard, like you you don't really have the power to do anything about it. It's really a Twitch issue. It has to do with people yeah, being yeah. able to make Twitch accounts so easily, and just you ban one, another one pops up, and the cycle just continues. So. 
I, I hope that they can find a solution to that because, and that stuff is just, there, there's no argument. It's just blatant copyright infringement. They're just stealing your videos and reposting them. And that's, yeah, that's not cool. Yeah, and they <laughs> trick people and uh, trying to get their money and stuff, you know. Yeah. For, for nothing. Or we're breaking some emails. I don't know what we do. Some scam, scam stuff. Yeah, need, need some way to verify new users on Twitch. I think, unfortunately, that's what it's come down to. You know, you can't just make a new account and go live. You have to do some kind of verification process. Uh, but uh, it's uh, above my pay grade, I suppose. Um, but all this, I, I guess, uh, I don't. not that I want to make this negative, but do, do you ever worry for the future of Dota 2 in terms of, like, multifaceted, not just from a broadcast rights perspective or you know, the little bit of corruption that we're talking about? That exists in all esports. But one of the questions I get a lot from, like, fans now is, what do we do about Dota being an old esport? Or does it matter that Dota is an old esport? You know, our average age of player is relatively old compared to other esports. Our average age of professional players is also kind of old. We don't really have a huge influx of new players coming in. A lot of the younger generation are playing games like Fortnite, Valorant, um, you know, these these new edgy Apex Legends, the shiny esports. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious what your long-term outlook on Dota is. Do you ever get worried about Dota fa phasing out somehow? Uh, honestly, I don't uh, really worry about it at all. I see a lot of newcomers, at least in CAS. I think it, it depends on the country. It depends um, on the region, I guess, a lot. Like uh, It depends on how popular it is in the region and stuff like this. Because in CS, there is a lot of uh, young players in the game, like mm -hmm. a very big amount, and they coming and coming and coming. I think it's the same in maybe Southeast Asia, maybe in South America, maybe other regions. Uh, Dota is not so popular, but it's like if we keep working on, on the game, like if uh, if the game will be still attractive, if the game will be still fun, competitive, and uh, if we getting. Uh, as much interest in, to, in the game because it's cool, everyone else will also come. So I don't think the problem of age matters at all. Like some games are can be very old and people still play them and still love them. Like it doesn't matter. About the new generation, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of things that Dota probably need to do to make it easier for new newcomers to play it because that's what where the gaming world moving too it's moving to game games being more casual and mm -hmm. a lot of casuality and stuff like this people want to start playing and instantly have some fun but dota is not about that dota <laughs> you start playing first you pass few levels of hell and then it's eventually gonna get fun yeah, yeah. so it's a dota about and then even if like uh, in f some years, whatever, if you feel like it's really, really old graphics or whatever, there is always an option for Dota 3 on yep. new engine or new engine. And uh, that's it. Simple that's solution, I feel like. Because the game is so fun, it's so cool, it's so amazing. I don't think it's ever getting old. There is no reason for that. Everyone who tries it and, uh, and put time in it will have a lot of uh, enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's. Uh, Another cool thing about Dota that you invest your time into really cool emotions afterwards. Uh, yeah, one of those games, I, I guess. Yeah, so you yeah. start to know that you actually getting like uh, some success with some something in the game, like after some time. Yeah, I mean, after you play at a couple thousand pubs, I, I think there's no doubt that you start to realize Dota is very much psychological, and the the degree that which you can tilt yourself, or how easily you can get thrown off if you're tired, or you know other stuff isn't going right in your life or you're stressed out, it's harder to focus or you get a little more frustrated more easily. It's, it's a game of psychological discipline. And that's part of what makes it so much fun and why we all keep coming back. You know, you lose three games in a row, you wake up the next day and you just want to make up for it. You know, you want to bring that pain to someone else on the enemy team. Yeah, um, or you watch some uh, uh, The Last Dance documentary and suddenly, <laughs> oh, Dota, <laughs> attack. Uh, it's so funny you say that. I just watched, uh, I just started it yesterday. I've watched the first two episodes of The Last Dance. Of course, for those that don't know, that's the Michael Jordan documentary that just, they, I think they just posted the conclusion of it. Yeah. It's, it's so uh, good. Chicago it's, Bulls documentary. Yes, but, Chicago uh, Bulls. Yeah. But, Mostly about Michael Jordan. Yeah, uh, he steals the show. But uh, so far, so good. I've heard like only good things about it. Uh, it's a pretty it's amazing. Like, yeah. I was on the 
roller coaster of emotions from my side. Yeah, if yeah. you're a competitor at all, it's just amazing to get a little bit of a glimpse behind the veil uh, into like that professional sports world of the level of dedication and sacrifice and just uh, I I don't know. It, it's yeah, uh, there's so much insights of that. Like uh, because all those team games were so similar like you can always find similarities if any team game doesn't matter if basketball football uh, whatever like uh, dota or whatever doesn't matter it doesn't matter and there is so many similarities when i watch it mm -hmm. i see so many similarities in everything in yeah. how things work you know and it's uh, amaze me and and what people achieve what people do amaze me how we do it the story behind it when you look at the story behind this like uh, the last dance uh, documentary it, it looks like fairy tale really but it's yeah. it's it's real it's documentary <laughs> there's nothing wrong there like, and it's crazy like uh, i even cried a few times uh, in a few episodes wow yeah, yeah. it's crazy that's uh, yeah it, it's serious stuff that that emotional struggle um it's interesting that you bring up so many young players in the cis region and i think you're definitely You've exposed some of the bias in that question of, I think North America is actually the region struggling the most with Dota right now. now China is a huge market. Dota's always been big there, and I think it'll stay pretty big there. Southeast Asia, CIS are all pretty healthy. Europe has some of the best teams in the world. Secret is getting, is Secret Enigma, they're getting more viewers than almost any other team right now. South America is isolated and it reminds me of kind of what southeast asian dota was maybe five years ago and it makes me confident that south south america might follow the same footsteps as c and really blossom into a structured scene with a few more years of like dpc and structured prize pools yeah. from the valve circuit but what about north america i mean right now it's pretty much just evil geniuses all the other team orgs have have kind of gone away. Cloud9 did a little bit of a stint with Envy, but they seem to be done now. The Dota, like North American, I think pub numbers are pretty low. When you see the entries for open tournaments, you know, like the old international uh, open qualifiers, not many teams in North America uh, entering into those. It's you know like 10, to 10 times more in Europe and in CIS than what we were getting in North America. That that scares me a little bit. Being a <laughs> being a North American, yeah, something needs needs to be done for sure. I feel like uh, this is the region where like something needs to be done for sure. There is uh, a lot of um, with a lot of things is because of um, uh, people using PlayStation, Xbox, right? All mm -hmm. those kind of stuff in yep. uh, in North America much more than anywhere else. Like here, it's not so popular at all. So I think that's also like a little bit part of culture, right? Definitely. Maybe in a way, I don't know. Like, uh, but definitely we need some more tournaments. It was cool that we had like uh, TI and Seattle. Maybe yeah. we need something like uh, another some other tournaments going. I remember MOG also. I remember ESL New York and stuff like this. Like where should it have been ESL LA, right? And then quarantine. Say yes. hello. That's, <laughs> yeah. No, that's a so, good point. ESL Los Angeles was supposed to happen, and that that was just bad luck. I mean, that was as bad as it gets. That quarantine started two days after people arrived. Like Slacks flew to Los Angeles and then had to fly home. <laughs> like that. That's, I feel so bad for ESL. It's bad. <laughs> it's awful. Um, and it does feel like Los Angeles is really where most of the Dota two. It's like LA and Seattle in terms of North America. Everywhere else. Other games are more popular. I think ESL New York was tough for Dota. I don't think they made money on that event. I don't think they sold enough tickets to make it worth the cost because it's so expensive. Uh, Doing I an remember event... it was almost full. Uh, really? At least at one time when I was there. It okay. was like 2014 or 15, I think. 15. Maybe 14. Yeah. Maybe 14. I made, in they the... did two in New York, I guess. Maybe because I hosted... I, I'm getting my years confused now. Was I hosting <laughs> the one that you were at? I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember. I'm not sure. But the one I, I feel like the one that I was at, it wasn't really that full. And I, I just I got a negative vibe from the ESL staff that they were kind of like, this sucks. Manhattan's busy and expensive. We're never going to do this again. This isn't sustainable. I remember that was the one where they did a cosplay competition. And the winner of the cosplay competition got a whole case of Soylent. That was the that was the prize for having the best cosplay. And I remember when they did the presentation on the stage, the poor cosplayer was just sort of like, Seriously, there's no cash or anything. I just get milk in a can. That's gee, thanks. It was that. That it's was like, like a... you, do it, you do it not for 
Do it for cash. the love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> worry. Yeah, but uh, we definitely, I think that's the only solution to bring more attention to the game uh, in North America somehow, like to show uh, to people that the game is amazing, that it's worth uh, spending time for it, and then it will eventually grow. But so far, there is like someone with hard uh, marketing, like for example, Riot, where we were like pushing their uh, mm -hmm. League of Legends for so many years, very aggressive marketing with a lot of uh, advertisement everywhere, and uh, it was on, on TV and stuff like this. So obviously, when you have some game where it's no one's speaking about much, and uh, the game where like everyone's speaking about, uh, people are gonna choose like, oh, Fortnite, 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 go Fortnite, let's try Fortnite and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. We, we just need to share the love of the game to with other people somehow. I would I would love to see to Valve either invest in or maybe they just have to green light some sort of content that isn't gameplay. You know, like when we saw that Snapfire reveal, that little cinematic short that they made, I heard a lot of people say, I would love a Dota movie or animated TV show in this exact same kind of art style. Like how cool would that be to have like a World of Warcraft style movie but for Dota with some lore or something mixed in? Like I would I would love to see more Dota content that isn't just gameplay. And I wonder if that would help like the marketing aspect of getting more people interested in it and maybe resonating with that that younger demographic in North America. Well, hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> everything everything worth a try. That's for sure. Yeah, but I don't know that I just I loved that art style. I still I mean I feel like that made me like Snapfire more than most other heroes that have come out with releases that didn't have that same kind of animated movie introduction. You know, like I feel like I I really empathize with like that whole character compared to like Void Spirit. You know, he's just a per he's just another spirit. But Grandma, she's throwing cookies at people. I mean, come Grandma. on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, man. Well, that uh, that puts us about at the half hour mark. You got any uh, anything else you want to talk about this week? Any other new big news I missed that you want to talk about? Oh, let me think. Let me think. Oh, well, so far, uh, all I can say about uh, our team is that yeah, we are rebuilding. So I guess nothing more I can add at the moment. But I hope it's mm -hmm. done soon and we can start playing and getting the form up. Yeah, I'm really, really, really want to give some provide some results. I'm, Trying my best in this regards, and about everything else, watching tournaments, enjoying some dots. What can you say? A lot yeah. of dots on, man. That's that's one problem we don't have right now. We've got uh, Dota Pit about to wrap up, and that that uh, what is it? Blast Pro, the bounty tournament. That's coming up pretty soon. I think that starts in like two weeks. That should be a lot of fun to watch. Oh, well, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll see you next time. Remember, this podcast is every other week weaved in between the Russian version. Uh, get at us in the comments if there's anything you want to hear about, questions, thoughts, feedbacks, concerns, anything else under the sun. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Love you, everyone. Bye-bye. Keep in touch. <laughs>